Hello to the world. This is Space Cafe's web talk, 33 minutes with Dr. Brian Whedon. We'll begin soon. Thanks for joining us for this exciting event today. Um, we expect the largest aud audience in the history of our Space Cafe web talks. Thank you also for your feedback about last week's event with Carla Sharp. I know we faced a number of technical challenges, but I hope those interested in the re-recorded video got the material. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and co-publisher of spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I hope many of you know our website, our bi-weekly or our daily newsletter already. This last week, uh, we launched the first episode of our Space uh, Cafe podcast. Check your inbox or subscribe to the newsletters on our website. We will be hosting our Space Cafe web talks on a weekly base. I hope you mark Tuesdays at the same time in your calendars already. A bit of needed housekeeping. Please be informed that we are recording this webinar session and we make it available on spacewatch.global in a few days. We try to stream um, the Space Cafe on Facebook Live, but that doesn't work today, unfortunately. If you would like to ask a question, just only use the Q&A section on the lower end of the webinar or screen. You can also vote for questions. And if we don't get to your question during the session, we will be follow up with them later. My distinguished guest today is one of the rock stars of the global space security community someone who is omnipresent in the global in the good sense on all media right now so i'm very pleased that he found the time for us today a warm welcome dr brian whedon who joins us today from the lockdown in washington if i'm correct brian is the D director of program planning for a secure world foundation and has nearly two decades of professional experience in space operation and space policy brian directs strategic planning for fu future year projects to meet the foundation's goals and objectives and conducts research on space debris, global space situation awareness, space traffic management, protection of space assets and space governance. He also organized national and international workshops to increase awareness of and facilitate dialogue on space security, stability and sustainability topics. He is a member and former chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Space Technologies, a member of ICRES to NOAA and the executive director of CONFERS and much, much more. We could talk about his outstanding career through this entire show, but that is not why all of you joined today. Brian, thanks for being here and we are looking forward to your briefing. Over to you. Thank you, Torsten. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, today, uh, uh, Torsten has asked me to give an overview of uh, the new edition of a report that Secure World has been putting out for about three years now called our Global Counter Space Capabilities Report. And this is our attempt to collect as much open source knowledge as we can find about what various countries are doing on counter space capabilities. So what do we mean by counter space? Well, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see what we mean by this. Essentially, a counter space is essentially what, what the English definition is, countering space. They are capabilities or techniques that are used to gain what the military calls space superiority and interfere with um, another country's ability to use space to support its military or other operations. When we study them in our report, we divide everything up into five major categories. The first category are direct ascent. So these are missiles that are launched from the Earth and they have some sort of a, a vehicle on top that collides with the satellite to destroy them. The second are co-orbital. Uh, these are, are launched from the Earth, but they go into orbit and become satellites themselves. And then at some point, they alter their orbit to approach, perhaps collide, or do something else uh, to a target object. We then have directed energy. 
Uh, this is uh, most commonly known as lasers, but there are other types of, cap of, of technologies in here, but you're talking about focus or direct energy that can be used to blind or dazzle, or perhaps even do physical damage um, on the high end. Then we have electronic warfare. Uh, this is the use and manipulation of radio frequencies and electronic signals uh, to have various uh, interference effects with communications or radar. We have cyber attacks. Uh, these are things that target the software that is used to control a system or the network that is used to communicate. Um, and then finally, there's a new category we added this year called space situational awareness. Uh, this is just general ability to have knowledge about the space domain and, and what's going on there. And the reason this is important is because SSA is generally how you know whether your space systems and satellites are under attack or how you would target an adversary's capabilities. So now starting with the next slide, I'm gonna go through just a brief recap of some of our findings from our latest report. Um, the first slide here shows sort of our overall assessment for what China's been working on. Uh, as you can see, they've been putting a lot of effort into developing a, um, a direct ascent capability against satellites in low Earth orbit, as well as electronic warfare and space situation awareness. There's also been a little bit of work going on um, on testing direct to send them may go higher, as well as some of the core technologies for core orbital capabilities. Uh, but so far, we don't, see, we don't see those progressing much past just some initial testing. Next slide, please. When it comes to Russia, we see somewhat similar uh, in that they're, you know, they've got a, some testing going on in R&D for direct ascent um, and co-orbital capabilities. Uh, but the core orbital capabilities that Russia is working on seem to be a bit more advanced and a bit more firm than what we're seeing from China. Um, Russia also, of course, is putting a lot of effort into electronic warfare and space situation awareness. Next slide. When we look at the United States, uh, we see, again, a lot of the similar activities going on where they're putting research and development and a little bit of testing into both direct ascent and co-orbital. Uh, in the case of the United States, it's more focused on sort of under understanding the R&D than it is actual testing, uh, but the United States does have a very robust electronic warfare capability and probably the best space situation awareness capability of anyone in the world. Next slide. So as far as major events we saw happen last year, uh, one of the big ones was jamming and spoofing of civil PNT signals, things like GPS. Uh, there were some very significant incidents of this that affected the port of Shanghai, but also we saw in Crimea and Syria, in Syria uh, as well as in Norway and southeastern United States for military exercises. Um, we actually saw last year Russia seemed to be doing quite a bit more testing than what we saw from China. Um, when it comes to Russia, there may be three different programs that are involved in some sort of rendezvous and prox ops or core orbital ASAP testing. They also have a, a new direct ascent ASAP called NUDAL that's in development, as well as a airborne uh, d uh, laser dazzler system uh, called the Varia A60. Uh, and then we also see Russia deployed and using electronic warfare in active conflicts going on, Syria and Ukraine. Um, Russia, China, and the United States are all also all involved in rendezvous and proximity operations. Some of that may just be for intelligence or surveillance. Some of it may just be testing. Some of it may actually be sort of laying the foundation for co-orbital and satellite capabilities. Next slide, please. One of the new countries we added this year to our report is France. Uh, and this is a result of last summer, France releasing their first ever space defense strategy. Uh, and this is really driven by growing concerns by France um, that other countries may be trying to do things uh, to, to spy on their satellites uh, and possibly even interfere with them in a time of crisis. So they've announced that they're elevating some of their existing military space capabilities to a new space command. Uh, they are uh, discussing future technologies, uh, such as the ability to have better space situation awareness around their satellites, particularly in geostationary orbit, and then possibly also having their own offensive or defensive counterspace capabilities. Uh, they talked about having ground-based laser dazzlers and then perhaps mounting capabilities on small satellites that could be used as countermeasures uh, to prevent adversary satellites from 
uh, interfering with uh, French satellites. As finally, they also talked about upgrading their ground-based space situation awareness capabilities. Next slide. The other country we added this year was Japan. Um, Japan is an interesting case because for the longest time they were not focusing on military use of space, but today uh, they definitely have a much more focus on how they use space for, for example, intelligence capabilities or missile defense. Um, and then so they're also worried about how they're going to protect those capabilities. Uh, there has not been a specific announcement from Japan yet about what kind of counter space capabilities they will be developing, but they have announced that they are doing an internal review um, to determine what that's going to look like um, and when they will be fielding it. They don't officially have a direct ascent capability, but they are partners in a U.S. missile defense system that was used about 12 years ago to shoot down a satellite. Uh, and then finally, Japan is have, investing heavily in improving its space situation awareness. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, we, we added an update to what India has been working on. Um, we'd been looking at what India was, was doing for a couple of years. We actually talked in 2018 about how they might be conducting an anti-satellite test in the future. Um, and unfortunately, that is exactly what happened uh, in 2019 when they destroyed one of their own satellites. Uh, there are still some pieces of debris from that test on orbit, uh, although thankfully only about 10 of them or so. Uh, what we saw from them last year following the test was further efforts in India to upgrade the way their military is organized for space. Um, they're doing some more exercises. Uh, and then finally, they're also focusing on developing their own space situation awareness capabilities uh, to be, again, like other countries, to be able to better detect attacks and threats, as well as possibly target adversary satellites in the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Torsten and we can talk about some questions and answers. Oh, oh sorry, one more thing. Yep. Um, for those of you who want to read out more, um, the entire report can be downloaded for free um, at our website on the link here. Uh, and at some point in the future, when we're all doing physical in-person meetings, we will have some printed copies available as well. Cool. Thank you, Brian. Um, Welcome. What a great overview. Um, please, are all of you outside, or, or you can send in your, your questions if you like. We got a few or, of them already. Um, let me start with uh, a few uh, questions from, from my end. Um, what are the advantages of using open source for the study, and what are the disadvantages and limitations, which I'm quite sure they will be what well, they are? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question when we get all the time. So I would say the advantage is we can actually do this work. One of the main reasons we decided to start writing this report was our frustration that the, this kind of information was not out there. Um, a lot of it was being done by, collected by governments and it was all classified. And so it was very difficult to get a really good handle on what was going on and then discuss it and sort of look at methods and, and sort of do this analysis of what's real and what's not real. Uh, and so that's what prompted us to go ahead and, and try and put this report together. So I'd say the first advantage of using open source is that it's available. We can talk about it. We can write about it. We don't have to be locked behind this, this classification barrier. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is sifting through all of the information that's available and trying to figure out what's real and what's not. Uh, you know, a big part of our effort is, or a big part of our work every year when we do the updates, is just reading through all these news stories that happen to mention somebody did something or somebody tested something, and then we have to go ask ourselves, is this true or not? And how can we validate this? And so we have to dig through all sorts of other information to try and correlate it, trying to determine what actually happened. Um, because oftentimes, you know, these news stories will have a, a kernel of truth but there's, you know, some some speculation on top of it, or something got exaggerated, or they they you know the reporter had talked to somebody who was reporting on something, but but had internal bias, and so sorting through all of that is really what the difficult part is. I read very carefully in your report in the in the um, first on the first uh, um, pages 
that um, you had some difficulties with the, with the media working on the resources um, or with the resources. So I've taken that. Um, that is the third edition uh, already of the uh, Global Counterspace Capability Study that you have co-authored. How would you assess the state of global space security in 2020 compared to the previous years? Well, I, overall, I would say it's it's not great, but there is a glimmer of hope. So let me un unpack that a little bit. I say not great because over the course of the three years we've been doing this, what we're seeing is a proliferation of these capabilities. More countries are starting to develop their own programs, to look at developing their own counter space capabilities, and investing in the R&D and technologies. So far, it's not huge. We're talking about probably less than a dozen countries, uh, but that number is growing. And so this is something that's serious, and it's a, a challenge that's gonna be with us in the future. We're gonna have to deal with situations where in a future conflict that's happening here on Earth, there is probably gonna be a space component to it. Okay. The, the good news though, is that so far that space component of military conflict and warfare has been limited to what we would consider to be temporary or reversible means. Essentially, you know, electronic warfare and, and cyber attacks. That is what we're seeing being operationally used. And while that can have military advantages, uh, particularly for example, like GPS, you can deny GPS over a part of the battlefield, uh, and so the adversary can't use it, that doesn't spill over then to have huge implications for everybody else. It's limited to that conflict and it's limited in time of when it happens. We have not yet seen hostile use of destructive capabilities against a satellite. And hopefully we won't because that is what's gonna have really long-term negative impacts for pretty much everybody who uses space. Okay. Um, we had already one question from the from the audience about the the noodle. Or on fifteenth of April, the U.S. Space Command said that the Russian tested a direct ascent anti satellite weapon, and this was the speculation. It was the PL ninety noodle. What is your assessment of this test? Yeah, that is our assessment as well. Um, we're actually having a, a webinar coming up uh, on Friday. Uh, to talk through this in, in some more length with some other experts. But our assessment is it was a new doll. Uh, they, the, the, the NOTAM, so these are the, the warnings that, that countries provide to air traffic um, about missile flights and potential reentries. Uh, the the NOTAMs released for this match very closely with several other previous tests that we've seen of this system. Uh, so we're pretty sure it was the Nudal system. Uh, if so, it would be either maybe the ninth or tenth test of that system since 2014. So it's it was not really something unsurprising. They 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 provided prior notice. It's a system that's been tested multiple times. Um, it, we need to be careful about talking about an ASAP test because this didn't, as far as we can tell, uh, well, it never it did not hit anything in space. And as far as we can tell, it wasn't intended to. It seems to have been more of a test of the rocket. Basically, you you know, when you're developing a new system, you first fire the rocket a few times on the ground to make sure it works. Then you might stack the whole thing and fire it to make sure it works in flight. And then you start adding on the payloads to it and start testing that. So what we're seeing is a sort of a gradual progression of that testing. Um, and so far, they have not actually targeted a satellite, which is good. Okay. So and our, um, I'm starting now taking questions from, from the audience. Uh, just to answer one first, uh, all the slides will be available, uh, including the video later on on Friday. Uh, latest, you will get a video with the, with the direct link to that. So um, one question here, is, there an, is it ethical to arm space? Oh, that's a, tough, that's a really tough question uh, because one can ask the same question about ethical militaries on earth. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I would say in general, space is an extension of human activity. And, and unfortunately, humans tend to worry about things like security and military competition. 
Um, and so to that extent, uh, you know, space is going to be part of hu all human activities, both good and bad. That was sort of the way it's been since the beginning. Um, you know, people don't necessarily, don't necessarily think about it, but when the Cold War space race started, it was really a national security competition between the United States and Soviet Union. Uh, in fact, the earliest anti satellite tests we know of were conducted in the late 1950s uh, by the United States. And then you saw the Soviet Union conducting a whole bunch of tests uh, between the mid 1960s through to the end of the 1970s and on and on. So this is not really a new development. Uh, it's unfortunately one that is spread beyond just two countries. Um, I, I think for us, the ethics come into play when we talk to countries and, and we, we, we ask them to consider what the long-term impact of some of these things are. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, I talked earlier about how, you know, if you do sort of, you know, localized GPS jamming, that is probably a more ethical counter space capability than trying to go and destroy all the GPS satellites, which would have just massive consequences for the rest of the world and be extremely disruptive and, and cause a lot of harm well outside of that conflict. Um, you know, that, that would certainly, in my mind, probably rise something that would be um, illegal when it comes to uh, uh, rule, arms, the rule of law of armed conflict. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole other discussion about, you know, how that applies. Yeah, I mean, many of those questions uh, we got in are, op are, are open to more than just a very short answer. Um, the next one I'm taking from our, our friend Kazu Kazuto. Um, do you think arms control will be the way to regulate counter space capabilities? Uh, I think arms control has to be part of the solution, um, but I don't think it's the only thing we can focus on. And I think it has to be done differently, thought about differently than we have in the past. You know, there have been debates about space arms control since the 1960s. Uh, more recently, since the 1980s, they have focused around trying to prevent the placement of weapons in outer space. In my opinion, that's not the right focus for this because we've seen from our report, a lot of our testing, a lot of these capabilities are not based in space. They're not, not based in space, they're ground-based. Mm -hmm. And so that would not be, you know, they would not be affected by some sort of a ban. Um, the other problem with trying to prohibit placement in space or the mere existence is suddenly that becomes to be, that comes a huge verification challenge. How do you tell whether a particular satellite is a weapon or not? Very difficult. In my mind, the, the arms control focus needs to be on the things we can actually verify and the things that are harmful to everybody. So if I was to, you know, if I was king for a day, I would be pushing for something like a, a moratorium or even a legal prohibition on the kinetic testing, on the, the deliberate destruction of space objects that, 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 could, that would generate space debris. Um, because you can see it happening, you can verify it, And I think everybody would agree that that is going to have bad implications for everyone. Okay. Thank you. Then we had an EU question. So what is your take on the EU level uh, capabilities? Anything happening at the NATO level? I mean, you mentioned France, but uh, that's it. So, so I'll, I'll talk about the EU and NATO separately because they are a little bit different organizations. So let's start with the NATO side. Um, NATO has been talking about whether or not it should have a space policy and therefore a sort of an, a doctrine and an approach uh, since roughly 2008 or 2009. Uh, they actually, uh, I believe at the end of last year, they finally published uh, the NATO space policy. And I think that's a reflection that, um, you know, if NATO is involved in a future engagement, uh, particularly with a, a, peer, a near peer adversary like, like a Russia, um, there's going to be space involved. Uh, NATO is going to have to figure out how to deal with counter space attacks on its space systems, particularly something like GPS, and may want to consider attacks on an adversary system. Um, so that policy is, I believe it was published publicly. If not, it should be soon. Something NATO has been thinking about. Uh, as far as the European Union, 
they they're they've been a little a little bit less public about what they're working on. Um, certainly Galileo has taken on a much more security focus over the last several years compared to where it was when it started. Um, and there is uh, a, a growing concern in the EU about how to protect Galileo um, against maybe hostile uses or, or sorry, hostile uh, attempts to interfere with it. But as a whole, I'm, I don't I don't. I'm not aware of any sort of broad EU policy um, on counter space or particular uh, offensive capabilities. Maybe we can uh, stick for a moment on France uh, because I got a question from Regina in here, um, and it's, it's especially about France. What are your views on their deterrence strategy posture in comparison to other actors? Well, France, as usual, is sort of an interesting case. I mean, they're 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 part of NATO, the part of the EU, but they've always had you know sort of a strong sovereign approach to national security. Um, you know, they're one of the few European countries, for example, that chooses to maintain its own uh, uh, nuclear deterrent. Um, so I, I see this as sort of a similar response. Uh, France is absolutely participating in EU programs like Galileo, like the EU Space Situation Awareness Program, but they're also concerned about having a sovereign response to things. Um, and, you know, my my understanding is a lot of this was prompted by uh, some things that happened over the last year and a half uh, with a Russian satellite called Luch that has been moving around the geo belt and sort of parking itself next to different satellites, likely for signals intelligence you know, eavesdropping sort of a mission. Um, and it did so to a, a French satellite called uh, Athena Fidus. Um, and that seems to be what has prompted a lot of this reaction from France. Uh, as, you know, they're concerned about this, maybe in the future that might not just be listening, maybe it may be something more hostile, you know, what what do we do about this? And so I saw, I see that their, their strategy is, is a response to that. Um, so France is both doing that sort of a sovereign approach, but they're also very closely coordinating with NATO, with the EU, as well as the United States. Great. One last question, um, because it was is rated very high here um, in the Q&A. So to what extent are Japan and India motivated by concerns over China's military slash space capabilities? Uh, they're motivated very strongly by what they're seeing from China. Um, we've been doing work in India for several years, uh, and in our conversations with the Indian scholars and the Indian space security people, they are focused very much on what China is doing in space. Um, and, and that's not necessarily true outside of the space world in India, uh, but within the space world, it, it, there's a lot of focus on China. So, for example, after the 2007 Chinese Dana satellite test, that is when India started their, their original uh, space cell, which was their first, you know, sort of military organization focused on space. Um, and then you also saw after that 2007 test, you know, India's program turned from a purely civil socioeconomic benefit program to adding a military and national security component. Um, so yes, India is very focused on that and, and Japan as well. Um, in our conversations with Japan, uh, yes, they are very concerned about what China is doing um, also with North Korea, uh, from, a, from a nuclear weapons and a, and a missile defense standpoint, uh, but, but from a broader space standpoint, yeah, China is, or Japan is very focused on China. Um, and in that regard, Japan is, is working very closely with the United States on, on sort of a, on how bilaterally they're going to um, uh, respond to what they see as China's growing uh, development of anti-satellite weapons, and, and also aggressive actions in places like the South China Sea, and, and real concerns over whether that is same action is going to also extend to how China uh, uh, react, acts in space. In this very complex environment, what you just are uh, pointed or drawn, um, how that, did COVID-19 kicked in? Mm. Is it a factor or is it something what in that scenario we don't have to worry about? Uh, well, I mean, look, it, it's having impacts everywhere. Um, when it comes to a lot of the military activities, I, we haven't seen a lot of impact just yet. 
uh, you know, for example, Russia just conducted this directors and ASAT test a few days ago. Now, these things are usually planned out well in advance. Um, and my guess is a lot of the militaries are, are taking precautions to deal with COVID-19. But in general, most countries view their militaries as quite essential. Uh, and so a lot of the military training exercises uh, and, you know, development work um, is going to go ahead. So for the moment, I don't see a big impact. Uh, but that, that could grow over time. Uh, mm. What I do think is probably going to happen is, you know, the pandemic and the resulting economic impact uh, is going to probably have an effect on the commercial industry. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the, we've already seen a couple of high profile bankruptcies. My guess is we're going to see more. Uh, and so that might have an, have an effect on the technological innovation and technological development that is driving some of this proliferation. So I think that could be something to watch out for. But as far as the core military capabilities uh, and military focus on this field, I don't, at this point, I don't think there's going to be a huge impact. Great. Thank you. And we agreed not to talk about the oil price today. So <laughs> that's great. So we, we know that can run for quite some time. Our, those that know me will understand that we will follow up our, on the space security in our series and our magazine um, because it's close to my heart. Our next webinars are on the 28th of April with Daniel Porras on the question, is it too late to prevent an arms race in outer space? And what goes hand in hand, what we just are stopped here to follow up with, with just another point of view. On the 5th of May, I will talk with Frank Salzgeber from ESA about ESA's support for space entrepreneurs. And I'm happy to announce here that on the 12th of May, I will have our Professor Rene Laufer as my guest in the webinar to hear from him about the future of small satellites. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And if you're interested in being a guest on our 33 Minutes with, please let us know. Even so, we are on a pl planning horizon at the moment of eight weeks plus. So don't forget to sign up for our um, daily or bi-weekly newsletter. If you haven't read the many perspectives from international space expert on the executive order of uh, US President Trump's on the space resources, please check them on our website. I think they're worth to read. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your interest today. Thank you, Brian, for um, this great briefing and being my guest. And thank you again to my entire team behind the scenes for doing that great job week by week. In a few days, the holy months of Ramadan will start. We wish all our Muslim friends and heartily Eid Mubarak and Ramadan Karim. Thank you for joining us today. I hope to see you next week. Bye for now. <laughs>